Hello, people. I finished the book. Captives by Linda Colley. Uh, this book, when I bought it, I took a quick look at, you know, the chapters and everything, and I thought, I thought that it was going to be full of, uh, you know, I thought it was going to be one first-hand account after another. But it ended up not being that at all. I mean, Linda Colley did quote from first-hand accounts. Sometimes there was a paragraph. More often it was like one sentence. Uh, the book covers the time period from like 60, early 1600s until maybe the middle of the 19th century. And it goes from like the Barbary states, uh, you know, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, uh, to, it goes from there to the Revolutionary War and the, the, the Seven Years' War, which we would refer to as the French Indian War. Uh, and then from there it goes to India uh, with uh, the Raj, with, with the East India Company. And very briefly at the end, it touches on Afghanistan. And this, the whole thing has to do with, with British prisoners of, uh, you know, some of these were outright wars, some of these were just colonial uh, police actions. Uh, military people and civilians that are taken captive by these other peoples and how they react to it what they write about it, how the news of it uh, is taken in England, you know, how, how people think about it, uh, you know, how people think about somebody from the British Empire, which, you know, was on a pretty big role at that time. Somebody from the British Empire being taken captive by a Native American or being taken captive by uh, a black person from Northern Africa, or being taken captive by by an Indian from India. Uh, I don't have too many notes. I got a few here. This was published in 2002. It's 379 pages. Right in the very beginning of the book, it talks about Tangiers, uh, which is close to being like right across the Mediterranean from uh, Gibraltar and I had no idea about this this was in the 1660s uh, England had a colony there they built a city they built a great big port with a huge breakwater and the you know the armies that kind of laid siege to their their brand new city there forced them after a few years to just give the entire thing up they, they blew it up they ruined the place before they left uh, third paragraph page 70 page 70 there's a lot of really cool illustrations in here Uh, Gibraltar and Menorca were also treated with deep seriousness by those in charge of the British state. It was the short-lived French conquest of Menorca in 1736, in which 200 ships as well as the future Marquis de Sade were involved, which marked for the British the real commencement of the Seven Years' War. Admiral Bing, who was made a scapegoat for the island's loss, would be tried and shot to encourage other British naval commanders never to forget the Mediterranean's absolute centrality to British imperial pretensions, sea power and trade. Gibraltar and Menorca were viewed as equally vital in Britain's subsequent global conquest. Its lost war with America, and the former even more so when Menorca was lost to Spain. In 1781, the British effectively gave up Yorktown to its besiegers 
by dispatching a crucial segment of their fleet from its American station to Gibraltar, which was also grievously besieged at this time by the French and the Spanish. This decision makes no sense if we adopt present-day perspectives on the absolute centrality of America. It makes perfect sense if we remember how vital the British viewed the Mediterranean in strategic, imperial, and commercial terms. It's important that everybody knows that because there's there's kind of a thing here in America about, you know, our ragtag colonial armies taking on the mighty uh, British Empire. Uh, the British, even though the Revolutionary War went on for a long time, the British were perfectly content to give precedence to areas like Gibraltar. And, and another reason why I marked that paragraph is I read a wonderful book once all about that siege. And, and it's an incredible thing. And, and it talks quite a bit in that book about how they had to move uh, ships around just to resupply Gibraltar because it was totally cut off. Uh, bottom of 234, top of 235... I just finished this book like, like an hour ago. It is against this background that we need to position those thousands of non-Anglos who chose to throw in their lot with the British Empire after 1775. Only royal government, a British imperial agent had told the Creeks and the Cherokee on the eve of the revolution, could preserve Indian lands from acquisitive colonial frontiersmen and many Native Americans decided that he and his kind were right. For what other option did they have? As for black slaves in America's South, the happy idea that Britain might, just, confer on them freedom as well as small-time favors seems to have been nourished by news of the so-called Somerset Legal Decision in London in 1772. This was widely interpreted on both sides of the Atlantic as affirming that slavery was illegal on British soil. Hence, one historian writes, with some exaggeration, the almost universal belief in slave society that a British victory in the Revolutionary War would lead to the eradication of slavery in America. There's been a lot of talk about this with uh, some of uh, uh, the critical race theory thing. Uh, I, I, I'm not all that familiar with it, but I know that one of the tenets of, of critical race, race theory is that uh, the Revolutionary War was fought in part to keep slavery legal. Uh, you know, the jury is still out on that, I guess. But the key thing here is, is since Britain had made slavery illegal on British soil, uh, if they would have won the Revolutionary War, then America would have been British soil. Bottom of 236. And this, I'm not going to read this whole paragraph, but this is something that Thomas Jefferson said in regards... What he wanted, Thomas Jefferson would remark, with regard to America's indigenous inhabitants, was the termination of their history, by which he meant an end to Native American landholding patterns and migratory customs, so that successive generations of white farmers and families could migrate triumphantly, triumphantly ever westward. And so, in time, it came to pass. Uh, third paragraph, 376. So Thomas Jefferson... Had some warts, and this is kind of a long one. It is often argued now that the British should learn more about their one-time empire so as to remind themselves of their debts to different parts of the world. Here, too, I am inclined to agree, but there are selfish reasons, too. Why the British could profitably acquaint themselves with what their empire involved, in fact, rather than assuming they already know, Acknowledging the degree to which it was not simply global and grasping, but
but also insecure, patchy, and dependent on others, and causes outside itself, might mitigate the sense of decline and nostalgia. The persistent feeling that this empire ended because of some deep-rooted national malaise and a lack of grip. As Paul Kennedy suggests, it is the fact that this empire lasted as long as it did that is remarkable, not its ultimate and entirely, an entirely predictable demise. British politicians, in particular, might usefully wean themselves away from the notion that a grand and intrinsic, intrinsic national destiny has somehow got lost along the way. Winston Churchill, who knew his geopolitics, once declared that, We in this small island have to make a supreme effort to keep our place and status, the place and status to which our undying genius entitles us. Churchill was absolutely right to see in British smallness an inherent challenge and obstacle, but the yearning revealed in his words for a special global status in the wake of lost empire has sometimes distorted post-war British policy. In particular, it has encouraged a persistent inclination to pursue, pursue empire vicariously by clambering like a mouse on the American eagle's head. That great bird needs no assistance, and we should look to our own directions. <laughs> it was a good book. One of those books that starts out kind of slow, and then as you get to the end of the thing, you, you're kind of sorry that, that it's done. Thanks for watching.